Not so many years ago, if you were to take a drive across America's farmland and through the countryside, if by chance your ride should happen as the day was nearly done, most every farmstead on the road would have the barn lights on. The farmer and a kid or two, or maybe even more, each one busy with a task, doing up the evening chores. Milk the cow, feed the chickens, gather up the eggs, throw some hay down from the loft, and water the sow and pigs. Sometimes, my mind will wander back, and I'll recall those days now gone, of peaceful winter evenings and the lights on in the barn. The smell of all the cattle mixed with the grain and hay. To me, it was a pleasing smell, though to you, it may not sound that way. And while filling up the water tank, I'd watch the cats at play, a nearly perfect ending to another busy day. Then gazing toward the house, I could see the kitchen light. Mama's fixing supper to feed us all tonight. And the warm glow from that window made this country boy work hard to get into that apple pie and that chicken fried in lard. But the trend today is larger and fewer family farms. Not so many places left now with the lights on in the barn. They tell us that it's progress and nothing stays the same. We must look toward the future and not the past from where we came. And I know that is true, but tell me, what's the harm? If I feel a twinge of sadness cause there's no lights on in the barn, everything is getting big and no one seems alarmed that the chickens and the hogs now mostly raised on factory farms. We've taken out the fences and the barn. It's been torn down. Takes a lot of room to turn 16 rows around. My favorite memories take me back to the way we used to farm. To a peaceful winter evening with the lights on in the barn. It's hard work being a farmer. That's why there is such pride in a beautiful field of crops. All across America, that pride shows until you reach <coughs> Cockleburg County and Ragweed Ranch, home of the world's worst farmer. Yes, there really is a world's worst farmer, and his name is Lewis Baumgartner. Well, I do claim to be the world's worst farmer. That's right, the absolutely, positively poorest farmer on the face of the earth. And I'll be honest with you, that's not just my opinion. <laughs> I have got a banker and several neighbors that will all vouch for me. But I consider myself first and foremost a farmer, and I farm because that's what I like to do. I'm not in it just for the big money. <laughs> but you know, I think another one of my problems is this little theory that I seem to subscribe to and this code that I operate under that says anything that's pretty close is good enough. <laughs> you know, like, huh, that gate wasn't quite wide enough for that disc. <laughs> but it was pretty close. <laughs> but then one day, as dogs will do, a dog took off after a rabbit, chased it across the backyard, down around behind the barn, into a lot plum full of cattle, spooked them, run them through a brand new plank fence, tore up a gate. Uh, luckily though, it was not the one that swings. <laughs> so I put up this electric wire, just temporary, till I could get that little stretch of fence built back. And late that night, I walked down around behind the 
corner of the barn like I do every night right before I go to bed. <laughs> yeah. I forgot about that hot wire. <laughs> I'll tell you, that was one time that I would have given $100 to have just been pretty close. <laughs> Since 1987, Louis Baumgartner has entertained hundreds of groups, conventions, and meetings. Some called him Missouri's answer to Green Acres. Others recalled Minnie Pearl, Jerry Clower, or Andy Griffith. But Lewis was just glad they called and laughed. Here not too long ago, a fellow from over in Nebraska asked me, said, uh, what does good farmland sell for down in Cockleboro County? And I said, well, good farmland, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really know because we don't have any. <laughs> the only black dirt we got is where we drained all out of the tractor. <laughs> But I got to tell you, I had a little bit of a humiliating experience there one morning. I was sitting there at the breakfast table one morning, and I had a cup of coffee, and I was looking out the window and just kind of staring off down the road and not paying any attention to anything in particular. And pretty soon I saw my seed corn salesman stop down there alongside of the road, and he got out of his pickup and walked over along by my cornfield and looked out over my crop. and then reached down and took his little sign off my fence. <laughs> but I, I tell you, that old boy, he's quite a character anyway. He asked me one day, he said, Louie, would you help me out just a little bit? And I said, well, sure, I'd be glad to. What do you want me to do? He gave me one of his competitor's caps, said, here, wear this. <laughs> but you know, the word for today in farming, or we hear a lot of experts, or so-called experts, down in our neck of the woods, stand up and say, what you fellas need to do is diversify. You need to diversify and plant some of the alternate, the high profit, labor intensive crops. Well, I was listening pretty close till the fella said labor intensive. <laughs> and then I decided, well, maybe that program wouldn't work on my farm. But I've got a neighbor that tried one of these crops and he was getting along real good with it and it looked good all summer long. And then, as luck would have it, right before he made his first harvest, the sheriff found it and cut it all down. <laughs> and then we got this one old couple out there, Ben and Pauline. Now, Ben and Pauline have lived out on the same old farm all their married life. Never done anything very big, never made much money, but they never spent any money at all. And here not too long ago, there was an 80 acres that joined in that come up for sale. And Ben and Pauline had wanted this 80 acres for a long time. And the price on it was a thousand bucks an acre. And that was considerable more than they'd give for the original farm, but they decided they wanted this 80, they were gonna buy it. So they got with the owners and they made a deal with them and come the day to settle up on this piece of property. And all the concerned parties met in town at the local bank and they were all upstairs in the boardroom, seated around the big table. They were signing all the necessary papers and pretty soon it come time for Ben and Pauline to pay for this 80 acres. Old Ben, he just reached down beside of his chair and picked up a brown paper bag and dumped it out on the table. Cold, hard cash. Well, they started counting it, and they, and they counted through it. They come up $75,000. And Ben said, well, we must have miscounted because I know it's all there. So they counted it again, $75,000. Well, Ben began to look a little flustered and a little embarrassed, and as most men will do when they're lost and don't know what to do next, he, he looked over at his wife for instructions <laughs> and she looked up at him and she said, Paul, you brought the wrong sack. <laughs> Don't you just hate it when that happens? It seems like that whenever anything gets to bothering me or I get to worrying about something, I can go on the back of my place and back there I can just shut out the rest of the world and I can forget about my problems and I can really relax 
just sitting on the back of the farm. And to give you an idea, I was back there one day last fall, completely on the back of the place, far away from the house as I could get. And I was back there sitting in the pickup and watching the cattle graze and enjoying the nice fall weather. It was one of those really beautiful autumn days. And Oh, I guess I probably sat there watching those cattle graze for, oh, an hour or more. And it finally dawned on me. These are not my cattle. <laughs> and we've got a lot of interesting folks there around Mellisburg. We got this one lady, for instance, this one elderly lady. Now, she had just always dressed to the nines and just got her hair fixed perfect. And every time she steps out the door, now, she just looked perfect. And she knows it, too. <laughs> she is very much aware of her looks, and she is quite proud of her looks. Well, she was walking down the street there in Millersburg one morning, and she met this old gentleman, and real polite-like, he tipped his hat and said, Why, good morning, Miss Isabel. May I say you're looking lovely this morning? And in a very pompous way, Miss Isabel said, Well, thank you, Mr. Townsend. I wish I could say the same for you. <laughs> And he said, well, you could if you're as big a liar as I am. <laughs> and then we got these two old boys out there, Earl and Raymond. Now, Earl and Raymond like to nip a little bit. Well, to be honest with you, Earl and Raymond like to nip a whole lot. <laughs> and they were sitting there in a tavern in Mellisburg one night, and there was a television up over the bar had a 10 o'clock news on. And on the news, there was this fella standing on a ledge about ready to jump. Well, Earl turned to Raymond and says, Raymond, I'll bet you $5 that that guy jumps off that ledge. Raymond said, you're on. I'll bet you $5 he don't jump. Oh, excuse me. Well, no sooner had Raymond said that than <laughs> fella bailed off the ledge. Raymond, he got his $5 out, and he went to pay up, and old Earl said, you know, Raymond, I can't really with a clear conscience take your money because I saw the news at 6 o'clock and I knew it was going to jump. <laughs> and Raymond said, well, I saw the news at 6 o'clock too, but I didn't think that damn fool would jump again. <laughs> but you know, I try to look at my problems with a sense of humor and try to be optimistic. I think there's enough pessimism in this old world, and I think we need to be optimistic about what we're doing, and I try to be a, an optimist, and I try to look on the bright side of every situation, and I got a little nephew that taught me a lesson about looking on the bright side of any situation. And the way this happened, it was little, my little nephew, Mike, and he went out one day to play ball by himself. And he had a bat and a ball, and I was standing there watching him. And he pitched the ball up, and he swung at it, and he missed it. Well, he pitched it up again, he swung at it, and he missed it again. Well, he went ahead, and he pitched it up a third time. He took a mighty cut, he missed it again, strike three. And I was standing there thinking, I bet little Mike is getting pretty discouraged about this ball game by now. And directly, he just shook his head and said, boy, I must be a hell of a pitcher. <laughs> <laughs> and then, as I was telling you earlier about the old junk machinery, that I try to operate with. I parked my tractor out next to the road one night. Somebody come along in the middle of the night and stole it. Next night, he brought it back. <laughs> and he left a little note on it that said, you better get this thing fixed before it hurts somebody. <laughs> but it's really not that bad. I'll admit, it looks pretty rough. It's got a big dent right up across the hood where a, a limb fell off my machine shed on it. <laughs> Am I going a little too fast for this punch? <laughs> but you... <laughs> you know, as tough as...